Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Ford. I am, right now I'm a science teacher at Albany High School. I teach biology to mostly ninth graders. Um, well before doing that, I went to grad school at UC Davis and during my time there, I worked as a program coordinator and advisor at the Undergraduate Research Center. And they wanted to have me back because of how impactful and meaningful this workshop has been um, in its time. So, um, workshop is how to make an effective poster for a, a scientific or other sort of conference and communicate your research and your work to um, basically a general audience in a lot of cases. What we will do oopsies, um, in this workshop is understand what a poster is, why should you make a poster, a decision you may be forced into doing or told to do, um, but it might also be a choice you have at some point. Uh, if you present at the undergraduate research conference, you get to choose. Do you give a talk? Do you give a poster? What are the advantages, challenges of making a poster? What do we mean when we say effective poster? What do we need a poster to do? And then we'll spend most of our time on how to make a great poster. What do I put on it? How do I start? What do I use? And all of those questions. So my plan here is to provide you with uh, a number of skills, be able to communicate the purpose of a poster, differentiate it from other kinds of, of communication, uh, science communication. So how is it different than writing a book or making a video or writing an article or talking to the press? Um, we're probably not gonna run around three too much. Uh, we will strategize an approach to designing a scientific poster and uh, look at a bunch of posters, posters along the way and see where their strengths and weaknesses lie. Um, as we go through this, if you have any questions for me, a question comes to your mind, feel free to pop it right in the chat. I will see it as we go through and be able to uh, address it either at the time or later on. My plan is for a kind of action-packed uh, 40 minutes of, of poster tip after poster tip after poster tip and uh, leave some time for general discussion questions at the end. So, here we go. Lots of ways we can communicate our research. Um, posters are one that doesn't really come to mind first, and it's one that often stays like in science circles, but you could write a book, you could give a talk, you could teach about your, your research, give a workshop, have some kind of media production, make a podcast, make a video, put it on YouTube, write an article in an academic journal give out a press release, have the press pick up your research. All of these are ways to communicate your research and, and posters fall in the, into this too. However, what I'll argue to you today is that posters are really in a league of their own. They're different and they need to be treated differently and approached differently than all those other sorts of communication. We can't just take what we've done in any of those if we've written a paper and we can't just turn it into a poster. It's a whole different ball game. So to, to make you appreciate that, here are three different texts that I might send a friend if I wanted to go see a movie with them. And we have the long-winded, clingy version of this text, the short to the point version of this text, and then the creative visual version of this text. And when we think about three big ways you'll probably think about communicating your research as your time as a researcher is to write a long paper, give a short talk, or make a poster. And this is the poster, and this is analogous to what we do in a poster. We do something entirely different in a lot of ways. We represent our ideas very differently. Why should we bother making a poster? So it's a great way to meet new people. It's the most, um, and now, okay, it's pandemic meeting new people up close and personal isn't, uh, isn't all the rage it used to be, but it's the most, um, you know, kind of as a pound the flesh way to, to, to meet people. And you see a lot of people talk to a lot of different people in a short amount of time. Um, and you get way more of that presenting a poster at a conference than you do in any of these other settings. At conferences, best poster often comes with a prize. And so you can win some prize money, buy a new PS5 if you'd like with that prize money. Um, so there's benefits to making a good effective poster. It's a great opportunity to, as you buy into your research and you have uh, 
hypothesis that you want to get out there, ideas you have about your research, um, put it out there to the world. You get a lot of practice doing something really important in tailoring your message. So at any poster session, even if it's for a bunch of scientists or a bunch of people who study literature, you get people from all sorts of angles. They may be very familiar with what you're working on, not at all familiar. If you go on and present at the undergraduate research conference, you'll get you know, a professor in your department who shows up and they, they know all about this stuff but you'll also get you know, the person who's presenting next to you's mom and dad, and they'll come over and have nothing, no background knowledge. And so you get this fun challenge of how do I explain the same work that I did to, to both of these groups and everyone in between. And you get to put it on your resume and say, I was a poster presenter here. It's not just, I didn't just go to the conference, but I, I added to it. When we say a poster is effective, what do we mean? What is a poster supposed to do? And there are three big reasons why that is, and, and some are bigger than others. First and foremost, in most of the things we will talk about for putting your poster together and making it work is its ability to attract passersby. Your poster is not going to do any of the stuff that it needs to do. It's not going to to help you build any of the skills that I just went through if no one comes over and talks to you. And so we build our posters first with a mind on making it look cool, good, interesting, bringing people in. Does it pop? Does it sound fun? Does it sound like something people want to learn about? It is. You just have to figure out how to make it that way. Second most important is once you've brought in those passerbys, is your poster an effective visual aid for your story? It is not there to tell your story for you. It's there to be an aid for you. So I can point to this, point to that, point to this, point to this, and guide your audience through it. It's back up for you in telling this story. And then the last little consideration we consider is that Probably someday your poster will hang in a hallway somewhere. If you presented it at an online conference, maybe it's you know sitting in some folder somewhere. And somebody might look at it without you there. And so the last little considerations and, and adjustments we make are such that the poster can stand by itself and be okay. But that's minor, minor, minor compared to bringing people in and using it as a guide for your story. So in a lot of ways, it's kind of like a Costco free sample. It has to look good, like sound like something I want, smell good. Your poster shouldn't smell bad. It has to be quick. You don't want people walking by your poster and not stopping because like, that looks like a whole thing there. I don't want to get into that. Physics? economics, you have to draw people in. It's be something they want to learn more about. It has to look cool and be easy, or at least look easy, but it has to be easy and quick. The experience of somebody visiting your poster is not a half hour conversation between y'all. Two, three minutes to chat. You get a little spiel, they have a couple questions, they move on. That's the nature of posters in a poster session. So another way to um, think about making your poster fun, engaging, bringing people in is to make it less like the Wall Street Journal. Back in the day, you could get a print paper and you pick it up. And when you go to academic poster conferences, a lot of posters look like this, columns, a lot of words. And when you look at it, it looks bad compared to something like BuzzFeed. You go to buzzfeed.com, it's fun. I want to spend more time there. And so this Wall Street Journal page it just sounds boring. It's about banks and stuff. There's a lot of words. Read all that. I'm not excited. It takes a long time. BuzzFeed though. There's like cool stuff. I want to learn about that. Food, dogs things, things I want to click on, fun colors, looks neat, less words. 
Um, and so I'm drawn in and I feel good about it. And you know, we're focusing on drawing people in, bringing people over and something that looks more like Buzzfeed, less like the Wall Street Journal is gonna do that. So let's think about who's gonna to come to your poster. You'll probably write a paper about this research and put it out there for posterity in the academic literature. And people will read it. People who are deep into it like you will read it, but no one else. If you give a talk, people are gonna come based on, you know, the title. You put an abstract out there probably so they can read the title, read the abstract. Like, okay, this person like this, you know, your advisor might come, people you know might come, that's it. When you give a poster, your audience is a different group of people. It is everyone who thinks your poster looks cool. You get those other people too, but on top of that, everyone who thinks it looks cool. And your goal, primary goal, before anything else, is to get people to come over because it looks cool. Let's get into making a poster. And we'll do this um, first by thinking about, I made these little text things, uh, and think about which one took me the most time. And so certainly not the middle one. And then depending on, you know, they add new emojis every year. So I'd like scan for the right emoji, find all the movie emojis, da, 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 da. I'd argue that the, the emoji one took me the most time because I had to take this stuff that was fairly easy to just write the words about and turn it into a visual medium. And so when we're taking what our work is and we, you know, we've written methods and we've written results, it's about taking all of that and turning it into visual, 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 cutting the words, cut, 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 cut the words and add in visuals, 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 all visual story of what you want to tell. So to do that, we'll focus on the key elements of a poster and how to make them pop. And we'll do so in order of how important they are. Starting with pictures, followed by title, then data visualizations, grid system, the words on your poster, its overall togetherness, and finally, you, the person standing next to it. So pictures are hands down the most important part of your poster for accomplishing its most important goal, which is to bring people over. It will be the first and perhaps only thing someone sees on the poster. You can see a picture, pick up its meaning way quicker than you can read some words and pick up what those words mean. This giant picture of a tick pops. Picture should be big. It's the first thing you're considering when you make this poster. Give it the most real estate. It should be eye-catching, high quality. It should be cool. It should be like, oh, neat, gross, cool. And maybe it even relates to your research. Find some connection, some tie that's going to bring in anyone to your poster, to your research. Not everyone studies a cute, cuddly little creature or gross tick, but something, there's some connection that you can make to the world at large with a great picture that brings people in. I was advising a student um, and they were doing, uh, the poster was about, it was about nutrition. Something like that. And it was, you know, it was ho-hum research. But my idea for them was, well, it's about nutrition and so kind of related to nutrition and kids. And so I was like, well, you know, what about a picture of Michelle Obama? You know, she's somebody that people recognize, a lot of people like. The big picture of her on there, it brings people in. And I go, oh, Michelle Obama. Not really, the, it's not a paper or poster on Michelle Obama, but it connects and it brings people in. So for your research, it's not obvious what that picture should be. Make a connection, draw something, and then find that picture, make it huge, big, lots of real estate on the poster. Here's a poster that does that effectively. It's about otters. Otters are cute. You got to put a picture of an otter on it. The picture is big, high quality, um, in really high, high value real estate on the poster. Um, we read top left to bottom right. So that top left part of the poster is hugely important. It's where people look first. 
it's all about crayfish. Got a lot of crayfish on this on this slide. Um, it's clear here that they went with pictures first and then they did the other stuff. Blocking out that space for pictures and then worrying about the other stuff. Things like human faces work really well. Our brains are wired to latch onto human faces, make eye contact. We see faces before we see anything. You saw this woman's face before you saw the crayfish. Rewind it. <laughs> um, anything with a human face in it, you doing your research, draws people in. Next up is titles. And titles matter a lot. They matter even more when it comes to somebody walking by your poster. So if they like the picture, like, oh, that's cool. What's that about? They're going to read the title. And we, I think more than ever, we live in a world today where we straight up like get news from headlines. Um, I, I have a conversation maybe every other day with somebody. One of us goes, hey, did you see the, the other person goes, yeah, I read the headline. So I just scroll on Twitter and I saw the headline. And you have to write your title for your poster as if that's the only thing someone's going to see as they figuratively scroll by or, you know, it's an online poster, they digitally scroll by. So there's a lot to do on your title to make it work. You need to first and foremost speak to your audience. So know who you're talking to and write for that audience. You need to have your keywords, you need to tell them what it's about, but you want to cut down on jargon as much as you need to. If it's a general audience, like one you might find at the undergraduate research conference, you probably shouldn't use any word you didn't know before you started doing that research because your audience doesn't know it either. So how do you speak to your audience? Cell biology. This is a title from a journal. It's got a lot of words that people walking by will not know. You would never use this for a title um, at a conference for anybody but just like cell and molecular biologists. So you might cut out all those acronyms of words and rewrite this title. Use DNA. These are all words people know. Further, an effective title is one that's a declarative statement. This falls under like the don't bury the lead idea of journalism. Don't, don't make it unclear what you found. Don't make it unclear about what knowledge you've added to the world. Say it. Your title should say what you found. It should give the result or main message of your work. To do that, it uses a verb to do that. It's declarative. It says what happened. So this differentiates a declarative title from a descriptive or an interrogative one. Yeah, you probably answered a lot of questions in your research, but the question shouldn't be your title. People are interested in what the answer is. They don't want to know what it's about. They want to know what you found. So the declarative title accomplishes that. Um, I'm going to skip this bit here. Um, move on to the next bit about titles. Effective titles are huge. So once you've marked out that real estate for pictures, which clearly on this poster they've done, it's about gulls. They put a big picture of a gull. They then use the next biggest amount of real estate up top, important real estate for the title. It can't be too big. Other stuff that's off in front of the top of the posters is just not important. It doesn't help us accomplish our goals that we set out. Authors, affiliations, seals, logos. They don't do anything for our goals. A couple things I'm skipping for time. Next up, data visualizations. Whenever you can, use a graph instead of a table. Tables like words, tables are hard, use a graph. Your graph should match the rest of the poster in fonts, in colors, in themes. 
on your graph, make everything bigger. And I'll show you some tips on that. The graph that you put on the printed page or for a PDF is not good enough. You need to change it and make everything bigger on it for this meeting. Annotate your graphs. Show the audience what to look at. Don't expect them to figure it out. Circles, arrows. Make it look nice. It should be high quality to blend in with the rest of the poster. Here's a couple of posters that do a few of those things well. You can see on both of these posters, the graphs, they blend seamlessly in. There's a lot of graphs on both posters, but they blend into the poster. They're not separate from it. They blend in, they match the color scheme. On the left side, we see a lot of reds and a lot of reds outside of the graphs too. Visual identity. On the right, we see this teal. And this, this use of color too helps us maybe understand more of the poster as well. Teal maybe always means the same thing. Things are color coded, teal, gray, yellow. On this graph, on this poster, on this poster, they've done a great job annotating. So poster has some struggles, but they've done a great job with lots of graphs, lots of pictures and figures. They do so much to point out, look here, look there, circle, circle, zoom in, arrows, zoom in, measurement, arrows, adding all these things that may not be the way we do it in a paper or a book. But for the poster, we want to just point these things out. Let's get to the point. We're spending no more than five minutes on this. So let's draw the reader's eye, the viewer's eye, your audience to what they need to see to understand what the figure is showing. Make everything bigger. Remodel your figures. On the left, it's a figure from a past undergraduate research conference presenter. I advise this student, this graph won't work. Everything's too small. Make everything bigger. The left graph is fine for a paper. Looks great on the printed page. But if you're standing five feet away from it, the graph on the right works. Simplified it. Took out things. There's less going on there, but it's saying the same thing. It's showing the same data. Everything's been made bigger. Dots, fonts, labels. There's a lot you can do to make fun data visualizations. Um, Tableau is sort of all the rage and I'll uh, pitch you the opportunity when you make this poster to learn a new tech tool. Tableau is out there for making really cool data visualizations. Um, data Driven Docs, E3 is another one. Chartist is a web tool. Infogram helps you make infographics. These are resources that help you make things that look cool. Um, one thing they do is they push you away from Excel and making things in Excel because as I'll remind you later, uh, it shows almost always when you've used Excel and it doesn't necessarily impress or pop or stand out just because it's Excel. So here's a few posters that are used kind of the infographic nature and um, this can be an even more effective approach for building an online poster. But they use these, these graphics and they created with their figures and they've turned so much of the words that they would have into, into pictures, pictures, pictures. Here's another one right here. Just using visuals, um, making it infographic-y, having this fun feel, everything's bigger. Most of the space is dead space or visuals. Smaller part of it is um, words. They've prioritized the title. They put all this not important stuff down here. Another great graph as far as data visualization, really matching the poster well. Organization, some things could be bigger here. You know, I would advise that the dots and the scattered plots get bigger, labels and map get bigger. Some stuff still kind of small, but a great visual identity. So one thing I, I recommend you avoid 
is sending the vibe that you can't be bothered to change default settings in, in Office. So this otter poster that we looked at before, the color palettes in the, in the graphs here are the default Excel colors. When you make such a graph in Excel, it gives you those colors. And so not everyone cares. But there's a subset of us out there that walk by and be like, Excel, lazy. And so change it. You have a lot of options here. Use a color, um, making, you know, use the eyedropper, grab the color of the water here, put that in their graph. Use just this blue instead of a, a slightly different blue here. And that helps build the visual identity of the poster. Next up, your poster needs a grid system. Um, the grid system is empowering your audience into where to go next. So a logical laying out, and there's a million ways to do this correctly. Um, if your poster design verges on being unclear where to go next, number the sections, number one, number two, number three. Even columns, balance, symmetry all helps build that visual identity and leave a lot of white space. Leave dead, dead, empty, negative space on your poster. Let everything breathe. Consider how people look at the page. Online or in person, we start reading at the top left. And we move our way down to the right. So you can have a poster that goes down one column, down the next column, down the next column. You can also go across the top and then across the next row and then across the next row. There's no right or wrongs here as long as you're considering the direction in which people expect to go and that when they move from section to section, as you guide them from section to section, they're not getting lost in the middle of your poster. Magazine covers um, do a lot of this well. So they'll put the most important thing here, like the face of the star player up top, titles to the, to the top left, down in the bottom right. They don't bother putting anything. Maybe a barcode, maybe the price. But if you're selling a magazine, which is an old timey way to get news, um, you want people to pick it up and buy it. And they're just not gonna see the bottom. They're not gonna see the bottom right of it. So you wouldn't put anything important there. Going along with the grid system is your visual hierarchy. And so the visual hierarchy includes um, your fonts, font sizes, colors, your use of bold, italics, um, the relative sizes you use for things. Develop a system. Pick your favorite fonts, pick your favorite colors, pick colors that relate to your research and use them throughout. Heading sizes, title sizes, there needs to be relative differences between those things. Important things should be bigger, less important things should be really small. Acknowledgements, thanking your advisor, thanking your funders. It's important to have on there, but it doesn't help us meet any of the goals of the being effective poster. Make them incredibly small. It doesn't help you bring people in or tell your story. Um, you want to try to keep it to two fonts. Um, a common kind of approach to this is to use a serif font and a sans serif font. You can use one font. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, looks good. Um, if you bold something, why are you bolding it? Are you bolding it for the same reason everywhere? If you make something purple, can you make something else purple? Are they purple for the same reason? Um, this kind of interrogating yourself on the decisions you make in your poster are these little steps towards making a, a truly professional looking poster that pops and draws people in. So a couple examples of, of posters that, that do both of these things effectively. Columns here, the grid system. It's very clear how I should move through this poster. I'm starting over here. They've done a great job with title, pictures of birds. I'm starting here, I'm moving my way through here. I color coded the sections too. So I know, you know, I'm gonna stay in the brown section here and come down. They use space to breathe. They have a system. They're using one font everywhere. The font's never different. It's not different in the figures, it's not different in the text. 
they've used a color scheme. They've picked their colors and stick with it. They have these browns, blues, greens, reds. They're all there all throughout. The brown in the map here, just like the brown here. So it works together and it gives us overall this great look a poster we want to go learn more about if you think birds are cool. Finally, we get to the words. So what do you actually write in your poster? And we spend a lot of time on all the other stuff because it's all more important. Words really don't help you accomplish any but the last goal of your poster, which is to be a hallway decoration someday. The words outside of the title do not help bring people in. They don't help you tell your story. The words are coming out of your mouth. People aren't to read your poster when they're with you. So you'll have headings and some body text. And the bare minimum to allow the poster to read alone, to stand on its own one day, maybe. For your headings, just like in your title, tell the audience something. If you just write introduction methods, results, discussion, wasted space, wasted words, you don't actually tell the audience every, anything. So for your headings, use informative, positive statements. This poster, for its visual blithness, does a really great job at that. They don't use the words introduction or methods. They have questions and the results, they actually just state what the result is. These are figures that allegedly show this, a declarative statement using the verb evolves, drives. This shows this. They don't need an additional paragraph to tell me that now. I have the main message, I have graphs in front of me, really effective at being that. So for headings, declarative statements. And then finally, when your whole poster is almost all designed, you'll have some text. Never write a block of text more than three sentences. Short and tidy, cut, cut, cut. You see a lot of bullets sometimes on posters. Um, I would say 99 times out of 100, you're better off without the bullets. They take up space, they clutter it a little bit, and they don't really help anyone read anything. Um, short passages spaced apart do the same thing just as well. Get to the point, get to the point, write efficiently, cut, cut, cut words. The least important part of the poster. End with the words. Don't start with the words. Take all of these parts of your poster and give it overall togetherness. Formatting, sizes, how many inches this is from that. When you pick fonts, stick with them throughout the poster, throughout the figures. Pick colors, stick with those colors. If there's something colorful about your research? Are you a Kings fan? Use purple and black, just go for it. Kind of daunting, but there's a, I don't know who said it, there's a quote, all design is redesigned. Find a poster you like and steal it. Just do what they did. Showed you a lot of posters today. There's more posters in these slideshows, more posters um, in the files I've shared with you. Find one you like, just do what they did. They didn't copyright it. Another quote I like, science is what you can get away with. Especially when it comes to posters. These things are not, they're not being published for posterity. Some journal articles are for. Don't worry about copyright and stuff in your journal article. For your poster, hey, maybe you don't own that really cool picture of a tip. Just use it, go for it. Neat, orderly, not busy, not cluttered. You want your poster to speak to the flag of Chicago on the left, less so the flag of Milwaukee. The flag of Milwaukee has a lot going on. I don't even know what it's about. There's a boat. Why is the boat on the right side? 
What is the wheat doing in that? Why isn't it balanced? Why are the birds on the right side? What is that on the left side? I don't know where to look. A lot going on. Looks cluttered. Flag of Chicago, four stars, neat, organized space, a lot of empty space. Here's a poster that does almost everything we've discussed really well. They've made the picture the most important part, the whole darn thing. Their title could be a declarative statement, but it's big. It's yellow like the lily. Their research happens to be about the color of the anther. So they get a lot of their damages here and using those colors in their figures. But it just works. There's like a hundred words in this poster. That's it. They could probably get away with 80. They state their headings, their declarative statements, they have a main message that's big at the bottom. They have very not important stuff like acknowledgments, who paid for it, all that down in the bottom left corner. It's a really effective poster. Similarly, this poster has a really nice professional look to it. They've maximized their title up top. Colors work, fonts work, room for growth. But they've done so many things effectively, they're like, wow, you know, let's go talk to these people. Cool poster. They have lots of in infographic vibes in here. A lot of use of icons. So instead of like, you know, writing out all the things they did. A little icon that you can point to and guide your audience through. It's some sort of map I don't want to know about. But man, this poster looks cool. So maybe I'll go visit. Maximize that title. Colors here. Look how it goes seamlessly between the figures, the text, the teal, the orange, the purple. They keep using the same colors. Lastly, and not least importantly, is you. So the poster is there, but it is a guide for you. You're part of this whole thing. It's not just the poster. The poster doesn't stand alone. The poster gets people to come over. You have to pitch it. You have to talk people through it. If you're going to sell the product, the free samples for a Costco, it has to taste good. Every person that comes over could be somebody important to you in the future. You might become best friends. It might be somebody you work with on research. It might be somebody you go to graduate school and um, work with there. So every person that comes over, you treat like they could be somebody important and you try to give them your best. The most important thing you can do, and probably one of the most cringy things I see at poster con poster sessions is that you don't engage them. Draw them in. Did someone like slow down a little bit walking by? Hey, come on over. You have better to do, I'm stuck here. Have a takeaway. So different world in-person poster session. Over the course of an hour, somebody might visit 10 posters. Yours might be really cool, might be their favorite, but they might have totally forgotten. So having a takeaway for your audience really helps. Um, QR code on your poster helps. Be like, hey, just you know, just snap the QR code on my poster for you know my contact info. Business cards are really great for passing out. If you don't have business cards, a quarter sheet handout, which is us who you are. You know, if you're thinking about going to grad school and doing the same kind of thing, you know, a little blurb on that that you can pass to people. We'll stuff it in their pocket, but they'll see it later. When you get somebody on the hook, introduce yourself, engage them, draw them in, pull them in, invite them over. You're like a busker. Bring them in. Introduce yourself. Tell them who you are. Ask the person. Where are they coming from? Who are they? You got to tailor your message to this person. You're not giving the same spiel for everyone. So figure out what they do. Figure out what, you know, if my project's about history, European history in the 16th century, what does this person know about that? A history professor? Is it my uncle? 
introduce your project and then tailor, tailor, tailor. With any good science communication, make sure you start with an emotional buy-in to a giant problem the world is facing. And if there isn't a giant problem the world is facing that your research addresses, find one. <laughs> and then tailor your message. So you might have to start way back. You might have to start right in the weeds. But don't just jump into all the globity gub jargon of your research. Find out where they are and take them from there to your conclusion. Think about how are you going to explain this to a 10 year old and how are you going to explain this to like maybe a new graduate student in your research group two different people what are the words you're going to use what are the words you're not going to use when you're talking to a more general audience i think one of the most effective things we can do as communicators scientific communicators is not use words when we don't need to teaching my students about, we learned about carbohydrates recently. Never say the word monosaccharide or polysaccharide. I don't need to. It doesn't really help me tell my story. It doesn't help them either. They're just words that scientists use. So to get started, making your poster, how do I actually do it? Identify your story. Every great communication of anything is a story. It has a beginning, middle, and end. Can you tell this story in a few minutes? If the answer is yes, then this is a good thing for a poster. If you can, do less. Do less. Take one little piece of your research and put it on the poster. You should never sit down and make your poster and say, let me put down everything I've done on this book. Put as little as possible. Put the most interesting, the most compelling story, the most important thing, and leave all the rest of it out. Once you know your story, decide what visuals you need to help you tell that story. Are they graphs, maps, figures, pie charts, icons? What do you need? Pictures? Make a quick sketch of your poster. What do you want it to look like? Set up a grid. How are people going to read it? Pick your fonts. Pick your colors. Write these headings that are declarative statements. Arrange the visuals. Get that picture big. Title big. Where do the graphs go? And then add in a little bit of text to support that. Grade your poster, save it on your computer, don't do anything for a few days and come back to it. Your poster is gonna reach this point where it is popping, strong people in, looks professional, only if you let it sit, revise, let it sit, revise, let it sit, revise. And through that, you see new things, you see things you miss, you're like, that spacing is not the same over here or there. And you're going to make these little fine-tuning adjustments to it that each one doesn't really make a big difference, but together, they're going to make the whole thing pop. The last 10% of making your poster should take more than 10% of the time. Best thing you can do in this process is get a poster made right away and then spend all your time improving the poster you have. So you find your story, lay it out, make it, refine it, revise the story, make it, and go around and around in this cycle of making a great poster. More to the point, here are some mere musts for your poster. Don't include an abstract, it has no, it has no point, no, it has no place on a poster. Um, don't use photos as backgrounds. They can be distracting. Um, it's hard to get a photo big enough to be a good background. Make your title bigger. If you think it's big, just make it like a few bigger. Can't hurt. Does your title speak to your audience? Ask your audience. Make visuals bigger. Just make everything in the visuals bigger. And then make everything smaller to increase the negative space. Cut words. Minimize or delete logos and seals. Logos and seals can be redundant with words that you already have, so just do one of them. The University of California Davis seal says University of California Davis in it. You don't need to then write University of California Davis in your poster. Completely redundant. When you think it's good, 
condense your methods, cut 100 more words, change methods into an illustration, replace a table with a graph, annotate the graph, minimize your references. Don't include references. Again, this isn't lasting forever. Cut your introduction down, bold key phrases, use color for em emphasis, get rid of boxes, let things breathe. Any ink that's on that's not data, not important, not communicating the message, just get rid of it. Cut, cut, cut. Circles grab attention, add a circle symbol. A couple of notes before we wrap up on virtual poster sessions. So if you're if you're asked or you know you plan to present at a, a virtual poster session, requirements vary and, and all that, and largely people are just making a PDF of their poster and they're sending it in and posting it and maybe doing a walkthrough. So ask yourself when, before you make any decisions, is it only going to ever be online? So do you someday hope to like print this poster and present it in person? Then you should probably just keep making an in-person poster. But if it's only ever going to be online, build it for a computer screen. And the posters I've shown you today are not built for a computer screen. They're built for being three feet tall and four feet wide. You're often asked to give a video overview, so this walkthrough of your poster, write a script out. Use screencasting software where you have drawing capabilities and pointing capabilities, where you know if you're giving your walkthrough of your poster, you can say, like, you know, oops. You can say, look here or look there. And it's going to really help you draw attention and walk a reader through. When you're building for a computer screen, think about like web infographics and how they communicate their messages. Um, and you might end up with that with like a very different shaped poster. Because on the screen, we just want to scroll through things. We scroll through websites, we scroll through Twitter, we just scroll, 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 scroll. So there's no reason if you're designing a web-only poster that you would ever have your audience go left to right. That's confusing. Do I go left first, down, right, right first? Where do I go? So they're going to get lost being zoomed in. So this is an infographic about the Titanic something. But it works on a computer screen because I can just scroll down and the story is told to me as I go down. So here you may design a poster that is like a foot wide and like 10 feet tall. It's okay for a computer screen. Okay. Um, and I will, I will skip all my next level points and wrap it up. Um, as I wrap it up, the most important resource I can ever point you to for making a great poster is betterposters.blogspot.com. Um, the person who writes it is hands down, the, like, the person in this world who thinks the most about posters and poster design. His book coming out next year all about poster design and making an effective one. 90% um, of my workshop is based on his writing and the, the keys of posters that they've identified on that site. Hugely important. Will only ever put me in the right direction bunch of other resources here that can be useful in designing posters as well. But better posters is everything. So I'll end with a little well, quote, reading is hard. So shut the front door on your poster. Put less words on it. Put less words on it. Put less words on it. You can always cut something. Um, and for those of you who didn't get in the beginning, this QR code, that little bit.ly link takes you to a place where you can download these slides. Um, a whole folder of posters that are effective in different ways. Um, and you feel free to contact me at the email address there. But if you uh, if you have questions, now the, now is the time. Feel free to chat them or just speak up. There's only seven people in the room. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you have a great time making your poster. One person asked in the chat about the recording. Um, should be on the URC website tomorrow. Not my department, but it is being recorded. It has been recorded.